Hello everyone, I'm Adam Lent. I'm director of the Action and Research Centre here at the RSA and I'm delighted to welcome you all today to today's uh, lunchtime talk. Just before we begin, can I ask you to make sure your mobile phones are switched to silent, but do feel free to use them uh, for Twitter because we are filming uh, today and live streaming over the web, so welcome to everyone watching online. The hashtag for today is RSA Democracy. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's guest speaker, Zach Goldsmith. Zach's been a Member of Parliament for Richmond Park and North Kingston since 2010. He was previously a campaigning environmentalist and editor of The Ecologist magazine, but since joining Parliament, Zach has been uh, one of the most refreshingly independently minded uh, member of the House and an iconoclastic and influential voice across a wide range of uh, public debates. He has, of course, become very well known in the last few years for being a leading advocate for the reform of our political and parliamentary democracy, arguing for bringing power closer to the people and giving those people the tools to hold our leaders to account. So with all the election noise now at full volume, we didn't think there could be a better time to invite Zach to come and speak about his vision for a very different kind of politics. So please join me in welcoming Zach Goldsmith. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Um, it seems to be working. So I have, um, um, I think we have about 15 minutes or so and then 45 minutes of Q&A. So I, I, I'll, I will keep my remarks as, as brief as I can, but this is a huge topic and I'm thrilled to be able to talk to you about it, despite the fact that I really ought to be in Richmond and Kingston pounding the streets and knocking on doors. And I hope not too many people in my patch are looking at Twitter over the next hour. Uh, um, but nevertheless, this really is a, a defining issue. And I, I don't think anyone now could even begin to deny the, the scale of the problem. The, the, the fact that I've left my notes behind. Um, I've got my awesome data here, which I'm going to bore you with. Um, actually, I, I probably will avoid most of the data. But the, 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 the scale of the problem now is, is, is clear for everyone to see. And it's not just anecdotal. I mean, if I was listening to LBC on, on, the, on the way to my first event this morning, and it was all about the election. It was, it was politics as it always is at that time of the morning. And it was all very negative. Every single person who called in, without exception, you could hear them spitting tax. It was a kind of hiss with each new call. Anything to do with politics, particularly the politicians themselves. But, but, but it's not just anecdotal. If you look at the data over the last few decades, it more than backs up that sense that we all have. So voter disengagement is, has been captured. Uh, uh, membership of political parties is at an all-time low. Um, there are more members now of 38 Degrees, a, campaign, a campaigning website, than there are all the mainstream political parties put together. And, I, and this is the data that I was just about to look for. Uh, that between 1945 and 1997, the average turnout in elections was over 75%. But since then, the average has been 60%, and it's a downward trend. So you have the occasional blip. You have the Scottish referendum, which agitate and, agitated and excited a great many people. But the trend is still, nevertheless, downwards. And politicians are also obviously aware of this. And they tend to ignore the issue in between elections, but as you get closer to an election, it's something that people start talking about. How do you engage more people? What's the cause of this? And the impulse of politicians, certainly the mainstream parties, is to either blame apathy on the most recent scandal, um, and the big scandal, I suppose. There have been lots of little scandals, but the big scandal that's fresh in all of our memories is the expenses scandal. So there are a lot of people in poli politics today who think, well, it was all about the expenses. If that hadn't happened, everything would be okay, and therefore the, the solution requires us to deal with this issue of expenses. And th the other impulse for those people who don't reach out for the most recent scandal is to blame it on, on you, effectively, on apathy. Um, and I just think that the, um, th there, is just so many, there are so many reasons to to disagree with this analysis that blames voter disengagement on apathy. You only have to look at what happened around the time of the Iraq war. I think, you know, that we dispute the figures, but something around two million people marched in the streets of London against that intervention. Or look at the ban on hunting. You had 550, 600,000 people coming into London from elsewhere to campaign against it. You've got, I'm reliably told, over five and a half million people who are active members of conservation or environmental organizations. And that's just one sector of interest. There are many many other sectors 
as well. So I don't think it is plausible any longer to blame disengagement on political apathy. But if that's the starting point of the mainstream political parties, if those are the two things that people reach out to in order to try and understand and, and explain uh, a voter disengagement, then the solutions are inevitably going to be wrong as well. And I remember at the last election when this issue customarily, customarily raised its head and we had politicians coming forward with a, a range of ideas about how to deal with this all of them based on this idea that the cause is apathy. So you had people talking about rewarding people for voting for the first time. There was even a suggestion that people should be given free iPods. Uh, you, know, young, you know, young voters in particular, and elderly people would be given warm buns uh, as a reward for <laughs> turning. That was a, an idea, I think, Hazel Blears put, put, put the idea forward. Um, and other people saying, you know, it's not enough, you've got to make it mandatory. Look at the Australian uh, mechanism, you've got to fine people if they don't turn up to vote. But it all misses the point, in my view. And, and as far as I can see, and I certainly don't put myself up as an expert, although I've, I've paid a lot of attention to this issue, particularly since being an MP, where all the cynicism, all the skepticism I had before I was elected have been more than vindicated and authenticated since, in the four and a half, five years that I've been in Parliament. I, I think the basic problem with our political system is that even while the world has changed beyond all recognition and in an incredibly short period of time, politics has stubbornly stood still. There have been no fundamental reforms of any sort, nothing to speak of at least, over the last five, ten years. But we have a situation today where, unlike even 15 years ago, if you wanted information about your MP, you'd either have to wait for the scandal in the newspaper or you'd have to wait months for your transcript of Hansard, and that would put you in the 1% of 1% of 1% of people who actually bother to read Hansard, or you would wait for that quarterly newsletter that your MP would send you, in which there would be all the information that your MP wants you to read. Nowadays, your MP might be telling you one thing in your constituency, but when it comes to debating the issue and then voting later on on that same issue, you can know within seconds what they've said, how they've said it, how they voted at the end of it, and you can decide, have they voted and behaved in a way that they said they would when I was casting my vote at the last election? We have a population that, is not only, that not only has access to information on a scale that we've never seen before, and that isn't an exaggeration, it is extraordinary, and still things continue to change very, very quickly. You've also got a better informed, better educated, and less deferential population, I would say, than we have ever had before as well. But despite that shift, and despite the expectations that that, that has led to among the uh, politically interested public, which is, as I've tried to persuade you earlier, is the majority, politics has simply stood still. It is as remote today as it has ever been. And that is true at every level of government. It's true at the local level, where you could stand as a councillor specifically to fight off a development challenge, an incinerator, or whatever it is your, your, that concerns you in your area. But the moment you elect that councillor, you'll find that the powers that you expected that councillor to have to fight off whatever the dragon is that you asked them to fight off, you'd find that that power has been usurped by the central government. More and more uh, frequently, you'll hear councillors now from all parties asking themselves, why on earth have I become involved in local government when all the powers that people expect me to have have actually been taken over the years by central government? So local councillors are in a very, very uncomfortable position more often than not. It's true internationally. Whatever one's views of the European Union, whatever one's views on the quality of decisions made by the European Union and within the European Union, I don't think anyone can pretend it is a genuinely, authentically democratic organisation. We could decide in this room collectively, we're going to drop everything we're doing in our lives and we're going to campaign on just one piece of legislation one regulation affecting a chemical or you know, rela relating to endocrine disruptors or car engine standards or whatever it is that we decide we're going to campaign on, and I can absolutely guarantee that we won't move it, the debate one jot because the decision makers on the whole are insulated from the democratic pressure that is the cause of responsiveness among politicians. It's very hard to know who is making decisions. It's even harder to remove them when you do eventually find out. Nationally, which is the bit I suppose we're going to be talking about mostly today, it is only the, 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 uh, the, the, the system is only marginally tipped more in favor of the voting public, only marginally. So yes, you know who represents you in your patch, and yes, you can boot them out, but only once every 1,500 days. And in between those two general elections, you have no alternative but to just accept whatever it is that your representative does. And it, it is not an exaggeration to say that in those 1,500 days, an MP is completely untouchable. So if an MP uh, avoids going to jail for more than a few months, pretty much anything else 
is acceptable. An MP, I could, you know, if I let's say I'm elected again on May the 7th in Richmond Park and North Kingston, I could hold a press conference on May the 8th and I could announce that I'm not actually a conservative after all, I'm going to join the British National Party, even though there isn't even a candidate for the British National Party in my patch. There's nothing my constituents could do for the next five years other than be embarrassed about the fact that they're the only <laughs> people in the country represented by the British National Party, or I could just go off on holiday for five years. I wouldn't have broken a single rule. I could go off to Barbados and I could leave my constituency work to my uh, uh, trusty caseworker and I could just simply not go to Parliament at all. I wouldn't have broken a single rule. The code of conduct that I signed, assuming it's the same code of conduct that I'll be signing next time, doesn't prohibit any of these behaviours. I can do more or less whatever I want. And you may say those are extreme, but it's not extreme to imagine an MP making a whole range of promises on really important issues, issues that matter absolutely to the people who are electing him or her, and then breaking all those promises. That happens all the time. But there was no comeback. I could stand specifically on an issue of fighting off the threat of Heathrow expansion. It's a big issue in my patch. But there's nothing to stop me after the election taking a non-executive position with Heathrow and, and becoming one of the greatest cheerleaders. There's nothing my constituents could do about it. And I could go on, but I, I think you, you get the point. And I would say, therefore, that it's unsurprising if there is a sense among a great many people that it doesn't really matter if and how they vote, that very little is going to change. And, and people are, as a consequence, pulling away from the political process. Not pulling away from an interest in politics, but pulling away from the way we do politics. And my heart sinks when I hear people, including celebrity, Russell Brand, for example, talking about boycotting elections, walking away from democracy, waiting for it to somehow magically improve. Because I can't think of a single example anywhere in the world of people walking away from democracy to something better. Maybe you'll be able to contradict me in our discussion a bit later on, but I can't think of an example. My view is that if it's broken, you don't boycott it. You get involved, you get your teeth into it, and you try and knock it back into shape. And I do feel that we are at a, a pivotal moment now in our democracy. We've lot of, I've failed in my campaign for recall. There have been all kinds of other reform attempts which have been made over the last five years which have failed. But I nevertheless feel that we are at you know, what is increasingly being described as a turning point. I think there's a sense now, almost a recognition, even among politicians, that democracy is going to have to evolve now if it's going to survive. And that's the way it's always been in our democracy in this country. You go all the way back to 1832. It wasn't that politicians decided as an act of generosity to expand the franchise and bring in a few more people who didn't have enormous amounts of land. It was pressure that required politicians to do that. It was share it or lose it. That was the pressure that they felt. They had to expand the franchise. Big campaigns, peaceful campaigns on the whole, but nevertheless, real pressure was applied to politicians. There was an acceptance then that it was going to break unless something gave, unless a little bit of tension was relieved. Then again in 1867, the second reform, then 1884, right the way up to 1918 when women finally were given a little piece of the action, not all that much, but a bit of the action, and it continued 1928. Everyone had a vote over the age of 21, 1969, everyone over the age of 18. Each one of these steps required pressure. Each one of them was met with resistance, as you'd expect, but at this point, I would say that no one regrets any of those changes that were made. Uh, every one of them, uh, I, would, I believe now, at least I haven't met anyone yet who regards giving the vote to women or indeed everyone over the age of 18 as a mistake. After the expenses scandal, I felt that the moment had come. You had a, a different language being used by uh, the political leaders, the leaders of the three main parties at the time, and they seemed to really get that there was an appetite for and a need for reform. I remember David Cameron talking about direct democracy, local referendums, regional referendums, even national referendums, where the appetite for those referendums was high enough. I was really excited by what I was hearing there. I remember uh, Gordon Brown talking, along with the other two mainstream parties, said we're going to allow people to get rid of bad Apple MPs, we're going to bring in a system of recall, let people hold their MPs to account in between elections and not just at elections. I remember Nick Clegg went further than all of them. He talked about a new great reform act. I mean, this was big language we were hearing, big promises. And, and I, I, you know, I am cynical. I told you that a few minutes ago, but I was excited. I didn't expect a full-scale political reform, but I felt that we were going to take some big steps all the same in the right direction. It felt inevitable. I thought we were going to be moving at least towards something that looks a little bit more like direct democracy. 
Direct democracy, as far as I can see, is a, is a no-brainer. And just very briefly, we'll be talking about it a bit in the discussion, but very briefly, all it is is a, a, a mechanism, and it differs from country to country. It's not a new idea. More than almost half the states in the United States have some kind of direct democracy. Italy, New Zealand, Austria. This is some of the Eastern European countries after the fall of the Berlin Wall. This is not a particularly new concept. It, it, it can take many different forms, but at its heart, the principle is that people can have a piece of the action. They can get involved in politics. They don't just have to wait as passive recipients of decisions made by politicians. They're able to intervene. They can stop bad things from happening. They can initiate good things. If enough people sign petitions, which is how it normally happens around the world, you can earn the right to have a referendum. You can earn the right also to, uh, to take part in a citizen's initiative, to bring in a new idea, to make it law. And I believe that direct democracy, or a version of it, would provoke exactly the kind of national debate that politicians uh, uh, always claim they want, particularly when it gets to election time. And obviously we need to debate all kinds of rules and regulations around direct democracy. How far do we want to go? What are the issues that should be completely off limits? Should it be possible for people to intervene on issues like war? You know, what kinds of rules and regulations would be needed around expenditure, around media coverage, broadcast? But these are technical issues and they can be dealt with and we're actually pretty good at dealing with those issues on the whole in this country in any case. And you know, maybe we can come to that shortly. But one important component, I would say really important component, of direct democracy is this concept of recall, a concept that was not just a concept, it was a promise, a promise made by all three mainstream political party leaders before the last election. And it's a very simple thing. It means simply that if enough people lose confidence in their MP at any time, for whatever reason, and if, they can, if that manifests through their signing a petition in a given period of time, they earn the right to have a referendum in which they can get rid of their sitting MP and trigger a by-election and begin the process again. It's very, very simple. It's very, very pure. And what it does is it reminds politicians at all times that, yes, there's a three-party, a three-line whip in Parliament, but constituents also now have access to a three-line whip. And that when you make promises, it might just be worth trying to keep to them. And if you can't keep to them, explain why you're unable to keep to them. And before you make them, make sure they're promises that you would be able to keep in the first place. It would be a very, very powerful mechanism. I don't believe recall would be used that often if it was introduced properly into this country, but I think it would give people a sense of empowerment. I think it would remove some of the pressure, some of the tension between people and power. It would remind people at all times that if they really are dissatisfied with their MP, and if they win that argument with their colleagues, friends, and neighbors, they will always have the opportunity to get rid of that MP. And I mentioned earlier how, 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 how little power people have to hold their MPs to account at the moment. Um, uh, all the ex extreme examples I gave you about what an MP could do under existing rules. And I recognize that on the whole, those things don't happen. There have been examples of MPs going off on holiday. An MP even faked his own death at one point. and was found in Panama shortly after. And, you know, I, I can think of a couple of MPs who don't turn up to Parliament at all. They don't vote. They don't engage. I can think of a couple of MPs who've never held a constituency surgery. I mean, they're not that extreme, these examples. They may sound it, but they happen. They're relatively, uh, maybe not commonplace, one step back from from, from commonplace. But the argument we always hear is, well, you have a recall system already. You can pull the plug when it comes to the general election. You can get rid of a rubbish MP. And in my constituency, that is probably true. It's a marginal constituency. If I screw up, I will be thrown out. That's the way it is. But the majority of seats in this country, as you know, are not marginal seats. They are safe seats. And in a safe seat, you have people, an old mining town, for example, of labor voters who would never entertain the, the idea of voting for a conservative candidate, no matter how useless their MP is. You've got conservative uh, constituencies where the voters just couldn't bring themselves to vote labor. There used to be a time when you had that, that soft middle ground of Lib Dems where people could always rush to if everything else failed. But that's, that seems to have gone as well. Well, so for those safe seats, there's really very little people can do to influence the big decisions that are made other than not vote at all. And that's a pretty depressing alternative. Recall would change all that. It wouldn't make a seat any less safe for a political party. Those mining towns are still going to be basically Labour voting areas for the time being at least. But it would remove the concept of a safe seat for an individual. And that's important. It means that every single MP, no matter how big their majority, would be required at all times to be kept on their toes. But even more important than that, and this is something I didn't understand until I became an MP, it would change the dynamic in Parliament. So you have a situation today where the, the job of an MP, there is no job description, but if there was a job description, it would simply say, hold 
government to account on behalf of your constituents. You're effectively sent to Parliament in order to hold government to account to make sure that whatever decisions are made are made in the interest of your constituents. That's the job of an MP. Everything else is ancillary. Everything else is bonus. And yet the structure of our current system is such that you are prohibited from doing the one thing you're paid to do if you have any kind of ambition to achieve any kind of office. So the very people you're supposed to be holding to account are the only people who can promote you. They're the only people who can give you a, 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 a ministerial career. They're the only people who could advance your political career in any sense at all. So you have to decide in today's world, you have to decide within weeks once you've been elected for the first time what kind of MP do you want to be. Do you want to be a parliamentarian, hold government to account, even if that means voting against your own party from time to time, or do you want to be a career politician, in which case you subject yourself to a voluntary lobotomy and you do what you're told, and you read someone else's script for the rest of your life. And there are some people, I have very good friends in Parliament, who are suited to that role. I'm not one of them. There are people I can think of in Parliament, friends of mine who never made it into ministerial office, who are perfectly uh, um, uh, or even overqualified in some cases to assume certain roles within government, but they've been denied that because at one point or another in their political career, they've taken a stand on principle and they said, I cannot go along with this, I'm going to vote against it. Or they've spoken out against something that their party has done. And I think that that, that is, um, I think that is uh, one of the core problems. That is, that is the rot in our system today. And I feel that recall, it wouldn't necessarily answer that problem in a comprehensive manner, but it would help to shift that balance, that power that's wielded by central party, that power that's wielded by the whips, which you're never going to get rid of, would at least begin to be matched by a real power that people hold at all times. And I think that would change things dramatically for the better. I think we'd have a more independent-minded, more uh, raucous uh, parliament than we have today, and we'd therefore have better legislation, better scrutiny, and so on. The, the, the problem with all this is that shortly after the election, after we'd had all this big talk from Nick Clegg and David Cameron and Gordon Brown and everyone else, is that it all evaporated days after the election. And there was a hope there at that point that people weren't paying attention after all, that they weren't listening to all those promises and they weren't going to be held to account and no one was going to care that much because it's a bit nerdy. I mean, you're all obviously terrible nerds as well. And I'm thrilled to be in your company, but this, is not, this was not the issue that was going to excite um, widespread rebellion after the election on, on the back of these promises just being slipped under, under, under the carpet, which is, of course, what happened. But there was just enough pressure at the time to resuscitate one of those promises, and that promise related to recall, which I've just described. There were enough campaign groups who were interested in this issue from the left to the right and said, oh, hang on a second, you made a very clear promise and we want a recall system. So the government felt obliged to put together a recall bill, and they put together a recall bill. And I was one of the few people to read the early draft when it came out, a couple of years before it was finally voted on. And yes, it was called recall of elected representatives, but in fact, that was my bill. So it was a recall of MPs bill, uh, is what it was called. But it was the very opposite of recall. Instead of handing power to people, which is what recall is about, it handed power up to a parliamentary committee. They would decide whether or not a person qualified for recall, not people themselves. And the criteria was so narrow that all those things I just described, you'd still be able to do. You'd still be able to go to Barbados for five years. You'd still be able to switch parties, even though no one voted for that party in your constituency. You'd still be able to break every promise. You'd still be able to not show up in Parliament, not hold a single constituency, never hold a public meeting, never even step foot in your constituency. All those things would still be possible under the proposal the government put through. It was an absolute fudge. If it wasn't a fudge, it was a pretense. It was a pretense at reform. It was an attempt to convey an impression of reform, to convey an impression of having kept a promise without doing any of those things at all. And the problem with this, this law has just passed. I tried my hardest to amend it. I put a series of amendments which deleted the second word of the bill all the way to the second last word of the bill, and it would have removed all that and replaced it with something meaningful, a proper recall system, and it, I'm afraid I did not get it through. And the danger now is that all those things that I began by talking about, that sense of voter anger, will flare up in an uncontrollable manner at the very next scandal, when people who think they've been given this power of recall, they think they can get rid of bad Apple MPs, will discover that they can't, that they've been lied to yet again, that the very anger that gave rise to that promise in the first place is, will, will be justified hundreds of times over when they realize they have been duped yet again. So I believe that our leaders, all three of them, incidentally, are playing with fire. I think this is a really big strategic area. If, if putting the ethics to one side of having broken the promise, it is a stupid thing to have done. So the question I had to ask myself during this campaign, I'm speaking for too long, I'll be quick, um, was, was why? Why are they so reluctant to follow through with the promises that were made before the last election? 
And the, the real reason, of course, is that when you're in power, the last thing you want to do is share it. Um, and the opposition always imagine they're about to be in power, so they don't want to make too many compromises either. But the arguments that were given at the time, it was the same arguments used over and over again. We were told about kangaroo courts, mob rule. If you allow people to do this, you can't, tr you can't trust the, the masses with these kinds of powers. But that is effectively an argument against all elections. Um, I mean, there's no, you know, whatever arguments you can apply at recall can be applied to the general election we're going to be facing in four or five weeks. And, and the idea that, 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 that the constituents represent a kangaroo court is just offensive in a recall system. The only court is the constituency. The only jurors are the very people who are going to be voting for us in the next four or five weeks. Uh, and the same arguments, fear of the mob, fear of the kangaroo courts even, was used at every stage of the great reforms that we've seen since 1836. It was the reason we were told women should not be given the vote. They weren't as educated as men. They were much more hysterical, much more neurotic, incapable of dealing, wielding such power that men are very good at wielding, apparently. Uh, all the same arguments were used. It was almost verbatim. In the chamber of the House, the very same arguments were used over and over again. We're told also that direct democracy, recall or otherwise, would empower the newspapers too much. And, and you can understand instinctively there's merit in that. We already know that the press barons have tremendous power. Not as much power today as they had before social media and all the rest of it. But if you think about it, it's not a logical concern. If you are a press baron, in today's environment, all you need to do is terrorize 650 feeble and hopeless MPs. It's not that difficult. Every, every MP dreads waking up and seeing themselves on the front page of a newspaper. Much harder to bully and cajole 60 million people in a referendum than it is to have your way with a very, very small, relatively small number of, uh, of fallible people. Uh, and, and the MPs are no more fallible than anyone else. The same, by the way, is true of lobby groups. If you're a, a, an insidious lobby group wanting to achieve a policy change, what would you rather do? Would you rather have sit down and have dinner with the minister and persuade them to tweak a clause here or add an amendment there? Or would you want to go to battle with 60, 70 million people in a referendum? It just doesn't make sense. We hear all the time, in fact, during the debates on recall we were hearing uh, from, from, from a worrying number of people in Parliament, that people can't handle, voters can't handle complex arguments around complex legislation. But, but I'm not proposing, and no one, as to my knowledge, is proposing government by direct democracy, where every decision has to be taken by direct democracy. By definition, it would only happen where there is sufficiently high demand. And if there's high enough demand for a referendum on a particular issue, whether it's getting rid of an MP or bringing in a new law, it's because people have thought about it. And incidentally, there was a very interesting study done a couple of years ago. It wasn't a couple of years ago. I read it a couple of years ago. It was actually done about 10 years ago. And it related to the referendum on Maastricht in Denmark, where the, uh, the voting population, anyone eligible to vote, was subjected to a series of very, very in-depth surveys. People were asked about Maastricht, the issue they just voted on in a referendum. And then the knowledge that those people had was compared with the knowledge of the MPs in Denmark on the same issue. And it's, it's a different cosmos. The people had vastly better understanding of the intricacies of Maastricht than any of the MPs who were interviewed. And I remember actually when, you, I don't know if you've heard of Ralph Nader, who's always he's stood many times to be the president in the United States. And I interviewed him a, 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 a some time ago uh, about, um, uh, I can't remember what the issue was. I think it was just a general interview. It was a fascinating discussion. But he told me that he, had, he was leading the campaign against the North American Free Trade Agreement, against NAFTA. And he'd raised quite a few hundred thousand dollars to do it. And he realized he was going to lose. And there was no point spending the money. It was just a waste of money. He could have spent it on something else. He was going to lose. But then he had a brainwave. He said, I'll tell you what. I will give this money to the charity of choice of any senator who will dare come forward in front of the cameras and answer six questions about NAFTA. If they get them all right, yeah. the money will go to whatever charity they choose. And he said, he said, I'm not going to trick you. They'll be fairly straightforward questions. No one would regard my criteria as being unfair. And it was a long pause. Three, four, five weeks passed. And then finally, a senator came forward, Senator Brown from Georgia, who was a fanatical pro-NAFTA Republican. He said, I'll do it. And uh, he, they organized a press conference. And he was asked the six questions. And he got every single one of them right. And everyone was amazed that, that anyone had actually bothered to read NAFTA. He said, well, you know, the thing is, I wasn't going to read it. Um, because, uh, <laughs> but this, this, challenge, this challenge sort of provoked me to. And um, he said, but now that I have read it, I'm going to vote against it. Um, <laughs> And he became a campaigner against NAFTA. And I, I sort of feel that those people who say, you know, you've got to leave it to the experts in Parliament, um, 
it, it's, it's just absolute bollocks. I can tell you that when we talk about the scandals of expenses, we talk about people fiddling 200 quid here, 500 quid there, even house flipping, even the big stuff, it is nothing, 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 nothing compared to the scandal of what happens day in and day out in Parliament when it comes to voting on the minutiae of legislation. The number of times I've been in a select committee or I've been at a meeting of some sort or a conference and the bell's gone for a vote on a piece of legislation and I is, so I stop and I ask people, the number of times I have not been able to get an answer in the eight minutes between the bell and the closing of the doors and have therefore not voted. I don't want to vote on something if I don't know what it is. Uh, over and over again, there have been times where I have simply not been able to vote because not one MP, even whips, even junior ministers, even senior ministers can tell me what it is we're voting on. And, it, and it, I think if people, that's the one thing I have, being an MP that I didn't have before, is an ability to vote in part. I could speak to you 10 years ago just as I'm speaking to you now, but I couldn't have gone into the chamber and voted. I mean, if people don't even know what it is they're voting on, you have to wonder whether or not the system ought to be given a boot up the backside. And, 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 I, and I would challenge anyone who doesn't believe me, stand out in central lobby after this election. When the bell goes, unless it's a totemic issue, unless it's a really big issue, equal marriage or you know, something that the whole country is talking about, on the whole, you will find that most MPs, if not all the MPs you talk to, don't actually know what it is they're talking about. Um, so I reject that argument. It's a very long-winded way of saying this argument that people can't handle complex arguments is wrong on every conceivable level. But I just want to come to one fast, last point, which I think is really important. And that is a fear that many people on the left have in relation to direct democracy and recall. And that's a fear that, again, it's a fear of mob rule. It's a fear of the kind of gut rule, which is a term that's often used, that people um, uh, don't put enough thought into these issues and that the gut is always more, more, sort of more brash than the brain. Um, and, and, and that would apply to things, you know, anything to do with minorities, gay marriage, death penalty, and so on. But again, if you look at the data in all countries in which direct democracy operates, you find on the whole that the opposite is true. So you had a referendum on, in Dakota recently which overturned very punitive anti-abortion laws. No one predicted that. All the polls had suggested that this law was very popular with the people. And then when it came to a referendum, you found that the polls were the wrong way around. It was, it was heavily defeated by people who supposedly were very keen on a punitive uh, uh, approach towards abortion. You had Arizona, uh, uh, a referendum rejected uh, an attempt to ban gay marriage. Again, no one had predicted this in the polls. You had a in 2009, you had a referendum in Switzerland. It's considered to be the most insular, xenophobic country on earth. On the whole, that's what people think of when they think of Switzerland. And there was a referendum on making it even more restrictive, even more harder for people to, to uh, gain citizenship of Switzerland. And again, the polls suggested that this motion would be passed by a factor of two to one. But there was a debate, there was a discussion. You had two or three months, or however long Switzerland allowed. The vote happened, and it was the opposite. Two to one, people voted against this motion. No one had predicted that. They thought about the issue. And I would just say to you, if you imagine, I put up on this screen a picture of you know, the, 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 those two girls who were murdered by Ian Huntley, and I told you the story of what happened to them and said, now, do you believe in the death penalty? Your gut might tell you, yeah, you know, string them up. Who gives a damn? But if I then ask you, two months' time, you're going to vote on that issue. You're going to vote on whether or not to give the power to the state to determine whether or not people should live and die. And you're going to have to take a view on whether or not there are going to be risks, whether the law can really be trusted, whether the government can be trusted not to behave in a malignant manner, et cetera, et cetera. That process of thought, which is what happens in a referendum, would, I suspect, move most people in a different direction. Your gut will tell you one thing. Your, your, your brain, after a little bit of thought and debate, will tell you something else. And that's why I would say that, you, on the whole, when you look at the outcome of referendums on these kinds of issues, you tend to have a more reasonable, more thoughtful approach than I think some people on the left fear. And I'm just going to finish by just in the vague hope that there might be one or two people here who associate themselves with the Conservative Party. Uh, because when I argue with people in my own party on these issues, on particular issues around reform, as with other issues like the environment, you often hear the same thing. You know, Ed, Edmund Burke is often cited as the, the, you know, the founding father of conservative philosophy, and he's often uh, used as a, uh, you know, he, he, he spoke out, we're told, early on in his career against direct democracy. You know, he said that we are not a delegate, I'm a representative, etc. And these quotes kept tumbling out in our debates about recall, and people said, no, you can't, you'd be a proper conservative and support recall. But then I did a bit of digging, and I found this amazing quote at the end of Edmund Burke's life. He said, in all disputes between people and their rulers, the presumption is at least upon a par in favor of the people. And I, and I was able to quote that with delight during my debates in Parliament, but unfortunately I still lost the vote by a factor of two to one. I'm going to stop there and just on a happy note say that since the debates we had on recall in Parliament, um, 
I have been copied in on its correspondence by PPCs, candidates, up and down the country from all the different political parties, not just my own, who have chosen to make this a campaign issue in their constituents. If your MP doesn't trust you to hold him or her to account, why should you trust him or her with your vote? Now, I don't know how many constituencies have decided that, re that reform, recall, direct democracy are, you know, is a central part of their campaign, but I know it's a hell of a lot more this time than it was five years ago. So my hope is that the next parliament will have a lot of new people, and I think it'll have a big bigger appetite, there will be a bigger appetite at that point for another discussion about reform, not just recall, but the broader issues as well. So I do feel we're moving in the right direction, depressing as, some, as though some of the debates we had were, um, and, I, and I feel that it's worth holding out for that. But the very last thing people should do is walk away from the political process. I've spoke for far too long, I don't you can't see the clock, but yes, I'm going I'm to stop. So I've got a feeling we might have quite a lot of questions, okay. and you spoke with great passion, uh, so I'm going to forfeit my chair's privilege to uh, ask you questions okay, first so and just sorry. open it straight up to uh, the floor. So we have a question here at the front. I'll take two or three and then get Zach uh, okay. to answer. There's more and more hands going up. Uh, and there's a question here, and then there's a question there right at the back. So we'll take those three. Thank you. Um, First of all, I have to declare an interest. I do live in Richmond North, um, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> and, right. and I did vote for you, so I'll declare that as well. Uh, and you helped me out on a constituency matter, and I'll declare that as well. My, my point is, uh, Ken Livingston wrote a book many, many years ago, and the title was quite indicative then. It was, if voting changed anything, they'd abolish it. Um, but you, you quoted Maastricht. Maastricht yeah. is a good case in point, because France and Ireland voted 51-49. Yeah. But the problem was the Irish got it wrong. Um, and I think what Europe then decided was that they would get Ireland to vote again to get the right answer, but nobody thought that they should get France to vote again. Mm -hmm. So I totally applaud what you're doing, but there is also some data out there that says you will only be allowed to keep voting until you get the right answer. And how do you overcome that mm -hmm. in a, a democracy? Thank you. Hi, I'm Rich Wilson. We, we met one another. Um, it's a very inspiring talk. Thank you very much for that indeed. And, and I'm standing where I live in Stroud um, on a direct democracy platform. Um, and I'm only, only doing it was to try and create the pressure for the other candidates to do something similar, some, some, mm. exactly what you're doing. Um, and I failed. I found out yesterday for the first time. So I'm going to have to, unfortunately, I'm going to have to stand. Um, but what I'd be really interested in, in hearing from you is what arguments you'd use with the other MPs to try and get this larger number of people mm -hmm. who are supporting these principles into Parliament next term. And okay. right at the back there. Hello. Um, I just wonder if, what do you think about opening up more um, issues for general decision making for the whole population throughout the course of the Parliament, using the internet and being able to vote online for any you know, specific issues as they come up in the five years? I couldn't see where the, your voice was coming from. Sorry, I didn't think... Yeah. Right oh, yes, there. okay. Yeah. <laughs> right All right. So, I, in the reverse order, I think that... Um, I think the internet is incredibly powerful, incredibly liberating. It has its downsides too, which, which I won't dwell on, but it, it's, it does give everyone a platform. I mean, even on a personal level, I feel that with my Twitter following, I'm able to correct things that the press get wrong, for example, in a way that I simply couldn't before Twitter existed. It's very, very empowering. Anyone can become a miniature media baron now uh, of their own if they create their own social, plat social network platform. So that's a wonderful thing. In terms of reaching out to people, um, I think dig I was talking about this in the Green Room earlier. I think digital democracy is inevitable. It's going to happen. We're going to move in that direction. And we will reach a point at some point where voting is conducted electronically. I have concerns about the technology. Um, there's no point going on. There are concerns that I suspect everyone in this room would share. Um, and you'd need to be absolutely certain that rigging and corruption and so on would not be possible. But if you could overcome those technical issues, I think it's inevitable we're going in that direction. If we do, then I think the demand and the clamor for direct democracy will grow, as it already is. So people feel now that they're just as, a, you know, they're, they're as equipped, if not better equipped, than their representatives on so many different issues. Why should Parliament? have a monopoly on decision making and that sense will grow as social media grows as the internet and its reach grows as more and more people feel um, 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 feel connected in a way that we simply never felt before so I, I, I feel that that's a direction of travel I direct democracy will be facilitated by the new tools that exist and that opens up all kinds of possibilities with us so I'm excited by that 
In terms of the arguments you use with, or the arguments you use with, with, with fellow politicians um, or people standing for, for office, I, I mean, it, it, it is quite a long-winded process. And I had three separate all-day debates in Parliament just around recall, which is just one component of direct democracy. Um, and I, and I, I was amazed by some of the arguments that were used. You know, what about financial, uh, you know, the people spending too much to get rid of a sitting MP? Well, you know, you can, then you can control this expenditure. It's not that difficult. Everyone's expenditure is controlled over the next four weeks in, in the run-up to the general election. There was not a single argument that was used against recall that I can think of that wasn't an arguments against, against democracy itself. And, and I just think you, need to, you just need to plug on. You need to try and persuade people that this terror they have of the unknown, of the unpredictable, of the mob, is not borne out by experience. There's, I can't think of a single example anywhere in the world where recall exists, where an MP or a politician representative has been booted out as a consequence of a vexatious campaign. There have been lots of attempts that I can think of, but not one successful one. So I, I, I just feel that you know, democracy is something you either support and believe in or you don't. And, and what, I, what drives me mad is when you have reform talk in Parliament. Uh, Nick Clegg, I have to tell you, is, is my sort of bete noire on this because he made such a big deal before the last election. I was excited by things he said on reform. Can you believe it? I'm embarrassed to say so now. Um, I felt that he really did have an appetite, but it turns out that, that he's only interested in reform that empowers the party machine, that doesn't actually empower people. And I just feel that we, you know, there is no single magic bullet answer. It's a process that you need to engage in. You are already doing that in your constituency. I love what you're doing. I've followed your, your work and I know what you're doing and I'd love more people to do this. Just to push direct democracy onto the agenda, to make politicians and candidates engage with an issue which they may otherwise not have engaged with. I can tell you that in the debate itself, the last debate on recall, where the press had totted up supporters for recall and they predicted, across from the left to right, they predicted there would be about 65 people voting for pure recall in Parliament, my motion. As it was, we had 160-something, I forget the number. And that was a consequence of extraordinarily powerful interventions throughout the day by colleagues from all sides of the House. So that we were winning the debate. We won the argument with a lot of people there. And I just feel that we need to keep that discussion going, and it's a matter of time before we win. You know, 1836 didn't happen overnight. It was a process. Um, and the... You're going to, so my, the one, my constituent, the one person I need to remember, and I can't remember your question. Can we, well, can we trust politicians oh, to abide well, by okay. the decisions of I, referendums? I take your point, I take your point. But, but if you bring in a culture, you know, we don't really have this culture in this, you know, we don't have recall, we don't have direct democracy, we have the occasional referendum provided in very certain, very specific circumstances. It's not part of the way we really do democracy at the moment. If we, if we move in that direction, you'd need to ensure that the safeguards are there. But I do feel that, you know, in, in this country, if people vote en masse, for an outcome that they expect, they also expect politicians to adhere to it. I, I don't think people would put up for long with being ignored in the way that, that you know, the, the examples you've given are absolutely correct, and it was infuriating. I think perhaps because it was 51%, 49, um, it, 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 it didn't provoke as much anger as it would have been if it had been a clearer result. But I, I very much take your point. Okay, let's take some more questions. God, loads. Uh, gentleman there, very keen to get a question in. There's uh, a lady here at the front. And then uh, I'll take the gentleman there as well. Yeah. And can I ask you just to make sure you keep your questions brief because there's a lot of people who want to ask. Uh, yeah. Derek Wyatt, I'm a fellow and former Labour MP for 13 years. Um, actually, there was another promise made in 2010. That was if 100,000 people signed a petition on the Cabinet, on the Number 10 website, mm. be debated and discussed in Parliament automatically, mm. when it was given to the parliamentarians, they chose not to take that. Mm. They chose to decide which, which they would take. Mm. So the whole point was it was a complete waste of time. Mm. It's not, so just make that point, it's not the recall only. What if MPs were only elected for eight years and had to stand down after eight years and have to wait a parliament a year be uh, session before they had to come back to get rid of the dead wood? 80% is dead. If you have a safe seat, you can be there for 30 or 40 years. Well, I would have, I mean, I think so that's... Just, a, exactly, oh, let's take a couple yeah, more questions yeah, because yeah. Uh, otherwise we'll, yeah. we will run out of time. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I'm uh, actually Canadian, so I'm not an expert on your system. But I, you did mention the power of party discipline, the power of the whips, um, the lack of... Uh, the rushing of bills through Parliament. In Canada, our right-wing government has been putting through omnibus bills of 400 pages. So how is anybody going to know, even, the, even people who read it? Um, so in a way, I'm 
saying that you're blaming the victim. Um, some of these MPs might be reprobates, sure, but the system itself is, is wrong. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, we're trying to get rid of the whole concept of parliament, parliamentary discipline. I know in Canada, the party leader has to sign the nomination papers in writings, which means that you pretty, have, pretty well have to toe the line for that leader. I don't know whether that's the case here, but I'm quite sure that the whips and, and the speedy bills and things like that are similar here, Thank and you. I wondered if you could comment. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. And the gentleman there. Uh, maybe. Um, I've had the uh, misfortune or privilege to work with the last three UK prime ministers on a new relationship between citizen and state and being as disillusioned as you are with those, including taking part in leading, trying to lead David Cameron's big society into something tangible and practical. Um, just to support what you said, participatory budgeting, where it's acted where local populations have been informed about the difficulties of their decisions, um, evidence that people will vote for the greatest need and that they will vote very intelligently around the world, started in Porto Alegre in Brazil. I wanted to ask at what level do you think true democracy works? The Athenians thought it was 20,000 people, the polis, from which politics comes. At what level should it take place? And do we need more mayors? Do we need a North of England assembly, a Midlands assembly? At what level does real democracy take place? Okay, Thank you. okay so I'm going to try and be less long-winded than I have been so far today. Um, on the, the eight-year term business, I'd worry about that because I, I think that it's the, it's the fear of the next election, which is the one thing that keeps politicians on their toes at the moment. And there are plenty of people in Parliament who've been there longer than eight years who I work closest with because they're you know, most savvy, most independent-minded, and they've done a really good job. And there are plenty of people I can think of. I won't bore you with the names. But I, I, so I, I think if someone does a really good job, they shouldn't disqualify themselves from continuing to do that job if people have confidence in them. What I would have around the country, as a matter of course for all parties, is full-scale reselection before every election so that you don't have people just bed blocking for years and years with a constituency association that's too polite to move them on. I would have full scale open primaries before an election for each of the parties so that people can decide. And the reason that's important is I take my own seat, for example, I was selected by a semi open primary, which meant that it was an audience, it wasn't by post. And there were about four or five hundred people there. And I, I, I didn't know then, but I know now that the front row to the right, a whole bunch of people were actually Green Party activists. And they knew they weren't going to get a Green MP in Richmond and North Kingston yet but they at least wanted to make sure that the Tory candidate was the greenest one, and so they voted for me. And, and so they had a piece of the action. They weren't completely marginalized, and, and you know, I, hope that, I hope that I've done them proud. And so I think open primaries are really important. That's a way of kind of keeping out the deadwood, as you've just described it, and that's really, really important. Um, complex legislation, you're right. I'm, and I, by the way, I don't say they're all scumbags. There are plenty of scumbags in Parliament, but they're not all. There are lots of very, very good people there as well, people who work incredibly hard and do a good job. So I don't mean to demean, I think there was a problem with the system. There were plenty of good individuals. but but. You have to ask yourself, looking at the last five years, there have been periods of time where we've had two or three months of almost no activity at all. Lots of debates, no mo votable motions at the end of them, people on the whole staying in their constituencies, very low turnout in those debates. And then we whiz through something incredibly complex. So we pushed through something very fast recently around judicial reviews. It's the one thing people have when they think their government's broken the law, when they've got the so last thing they can do is take government to court via judicial review. The laws around that have just been changed. Most MPs weren't even aware of it. That's the kind of thing that merits at least a day of debate, not 10 minutes in between votes at the end where most people don't know what it is they're voting on. People happily voted away a protection that is core to our democracy without even knowing they were doing it. So time is an issue. And if that means putting less legislation through, put less legislation through. There's enough dodgy legislation. We could, we could cut half of that out and no one would notice. So I, I think we should give ourselves more time. And I think if a government is going to be subjected to full scrutiny, i.e. if you had a parliament that actually did its job and functioned, unlike what we have today, where you've got baying sheep, you could replace with laptop computers and it would make no difference at all. If you had proper, proper scrutiny, then government would not be able to get away with producing 400 pages of in incredibly complex legislation. They'd be held to account by parliament. So I think there is a way around that. And it comes back to emboldening parliament to be independent, to hold government to account. You know, that any reform that is ever put forward has to be judged. Does it empower people to hold their MP to account? Does it empower their MP to hold government to account? If it doesn't do either or both of those things, it's not a reform we should waste our time debating, in my view. 
Um, and then the, the last point was absolutely, it's a really good point. In relation, I mean, the experiments in Brazil around participatory budgeting are really heartwarming on every conceivable level. Also Switzerland, by the way, really interesting things there. You find much more shrewd use of public money. And again, in the common interest, this fear that the money is always going to go towards the majority and the minority are going to be left behind is not borne out. You can ultimately trust the goodwill of people as the experience shows. So I, I, I very, very strongly agree with that. Um, your last point was, sorry, my writing's so bad I can't read it. Uh, what, do you oh, what level? What what level? level? Uh, I, in I've been involved in a campaign with, to, to turn Pitcairn Islands into a, into a marine reserve. And, and there are only 57 people in Pitcairn. And I, and, I, and I was told it's unanimous, they're completely up for this. And then I met a Pitcairner. And I discovered there are eight councillors on Pitcairn. So that's what, one, one for every seven or eight people. <laughs> and this person said to me, you know, the council don't speak for us, you know. And I just thought, <laughs> I mean, it, you know, it, you're in real trouble there. It's, um, so, so, but, but ultimately, you want to get as local as possible. So I am a regionalist. I am a localist. I, um, I, I think that you need to, but the powers need to be proportionate. Local councillors need to be responsible for local issues. We do need to localize. We had a localism bill that wasn't nearly localist enough. And in many respects, it was anti-localist. I want people to be responsible. If a planning decision is wrong, I'd like to know who I boot out at the next election. At the moment, you, can't, you don't know who to blame. It's not government. It's not local government. You've got Quango here making decisions, overruling elected representative. It's murky and messy, and it's hard to know where the buck stops. So I, I would decentralize as far as I possibly can across the board. Time for three more questions, I think. Uh, there is a lady there in the middle of the, just there. Um, a gentleman there, and a gentleman there back. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I apologize, because I may not be able to articulate this question terribly well, but I, I love what you're saying and sharing. It makes a lot of sense, but I also feel that there's a, a them and us, sort of an underlying assumption or mentality, and obviously it's exacerbated by the press and by the scandals and all of these kinds of things, but I'm wondering what we can do to move beyond that. I mean, politicians at the end of the day are people. We know structures drive behavior. How do we, how do we build more enlightened leaders? How do we allow for the politicians themselves to transform so that the systems can transform more easily? Okay. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman there. Yeah, you make a, make a very powerful case for the electoral reform. Um, but uh, you started off by talking about the sort of malaise in the system as far as people were concerned about the political system. But I think you also need to address the constitution of this country particularly, which raises a lot of issues which separate people from the centers of power in the state, in fact. We have an unelected head of state. We have an unelected house of lords. All these things must be brought into the actual reforms that you're seeking to really bridge that gap between what are still, uh, in parliamentary terms and how they're seen as sort of medieval rituals and decisions, in, in terms of that context and okay. what the people really want and what their own lives are about. Thank you. And last question from the gentleman there. Uh, in your opinion, does multi-party coalition government help or hinder popular democracy? Okay. So, um, the, the first point, I, I can only tell you how I feel um, because there is no scientific or forensic answer to that. How do you improve the relationship between people and power so that you know, people do understand and respect that politicians are people and on the whole they are, on the whole they are doing a, a, a tough job? And I see that in a way that I didn't see it five years ago. Um, uh, and my, my sort of anger about the system moved from being about the individual MPs to being about the system. That, that's what's happened to me over the last five years. But I do feel that now, if you were to empower people genuinely to hold their MP to account, if you were to empower them to stop bad things from happening and to start good things up through the referendum and direct democracy approach, you, people would, that sense of empowerment that people have would, I think, take the edge off the anger that people feel. So when people call up and, you know, on the radio station and say, oh, they're all the same, there's no point voting, that wouldn't be true in a regime of recall where they've also had open primaries because if they're not engaging in the process, they've got only themselves to blame that they end up with an MP they don't feel they deserve. But under a, a democratic system, 
you have the MP you deserve. And you only have to win the arguments with your friends and neighbors. And I think even while that power may rarely be used, I think it will settle at least the relationship between people and power in a way that would be good for our democracy and enable us then to evolve and flourish and grow. I hope so. As I said, it's a hunch. It's not a scientific answer because I don't know. But that's, I, I feel that, that give people responsibility and control over the system and that sense of panic will go. At the moment, they feel that there's just no point engaging because there's nothing we can do to influence it. So much better just to throw rocks and scream and yell and be angry about the system. So I think, I, think it, I, I hope what I'm saying is correct. House of Lords um, is a particular example you gave. I, I suppose you've got to decide what it is that, that you want the House of Lords to do. So I, I'm, I'm conflicted on this. Um, I feel that the House of Lords, if you look at a transcript of any debate of substance on any issue at all, and you compare the quality of debate in the House of Lords with the quality of debate in the House of Commons, it, it's, um, it's, it's night and day. You know, you get proper scrutiny. All the failures of Parliament are picked up and corrected by, not all, but many, by the House of Lords. And on the whole, they do a valiant job. So I mentioned judicial review. That was picked up. I wasn't aware of that, by the way. It's only because someone pointed out that I ought to read a transcript of the debate on this issue in the House of Lords, and I could see that there was nothing there I could argue that I voted against the government on that issue. I wouldn't have been aware of it otherwise. So I was grateful to the House of Lords on that occasion and many, many other occasions as well. The House of Lords is made up of all kinds of people. Some people because they gave a big check to their party, other people because they're real experts. What I'd like to do with the House of Lords is remove patronage from the party leaders. You create a cross-party system of deciding what gaps exist in the House of Lords and then going out and finding those people and continuing to appoint rather than elect them. You haven't got anyone who understands the NHS, you get someone who's been in the NHS. People who understand defence, you go out and get someone who understands defence. And you make sure that you have as cross-party a body of expertise, not to make law. Their job is not to make law, which is why it doesn't matter so much that they're not elected, but to ensure that the laws of the Commons produce and generate are properly scrutinized by people who are genuinely experts, the kind of people who probably wouldn't stand in elections on a list system. If you go down the election route, you either have constituencies, which would, wouldn't work, you'd have two, two MPs for constituencies, or you would have the kind of party list system, the PR system, which automatically favors the party. You know, who draws up the list? Is Kate Hoey going to be on the Labour list or anywhere near the top? Of, I certainly wouldn't be on any, any list generated by my party. And now you might say that's a very good thing, but, but I don't. Um, and, and I so I don't, I, I don't want to see a mechanism that further empowers the party. I, I, I think the Lords can be massively reformed, but, but I wouldn't do it in such a way that would in any way strengthen that party whip machine. I'd be worried about that. And I think it has a really important role. Um, and the last point, I, I've got such a multi Multi-party coalition. Oh, multi-party coalition. Um, that's a very topical question. Now, because that's exactly where we're heading in the next few weeks. Um, I, I suppose it depends on... No, it's, it's, it's the inevitable consequence if that's what people vote for. There's no arguing with it. If, if no one has a clear majority, then the people have spoken and they want, they want people to do deals. It, it makes it harder in some respects. I wasn't hostile to the idea of a coalition at the last election. I thought there were things that the Lib Dems could bring. I thought they'd be good on environmental issues, for example, that I'd be able to rely on them for that. I thought they'd be good on reform, that I'd be able to rely on them for that. Um, I've been massively disappointed on all the key issues. I've stood outside the lobby at times and said, do you know what you're voting? And I've been a de facto uninvited trespassing whip saying you're about to vote for something. I guarantee you didn't say you were going to do this before the last election with minimal effect, I can tell you. But it's, um, it's, and so I have been disappointed. But the principle is not something that I was viscerally opposed to. And I think maybe the Lib Dems would have learned their lesson over the last five years and might behave differently in a coalition going forward. Um, and I think the same is probably true of anyone who's interested in politics who's been obs observing this. There's no reason why a coalition can't be a good thing. I'm not sure it was all that good this time around. It was good in some respects, but I think there were lots of areas in which the things that I was hoping one party would bring weren't really brought to the table. But I think that could change next time around if that's the outcome people vote for. So That was a very political answer. Well. <laughs> very uh, sadly, we've run out of time. Uh, seeing the number of hands that are going up, I think we probably could have gone on for at least another hour or more. Uh, thanks you to all of you uh, for your incredibly uh, intelligent and insightful questions, but particular thanks to Zach, who's spoken with enormous passion uh, and great interest about uh, the subject today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.